Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. In today's video, we're going to go talk about trapping merlins. Merlins are an incredible falconry bird. But before we get into it, because this is a trapping video, I need to remind anybody watching this video that most states, most countries in the world require extensive permits and licenses in order to keep birds of prey, train them, trap them, or hunt them. So do not attempt these things without first knowing the laws of your region. It's very important, uh, not only for legalities, but also for safety, for the safety of the bird and for the safety of you. Merlin falcons in North America, where I live, are our second smallest falcon. And I remember as a child, before the internet, we didn't have the internet back then, going to the library and checking out books on birds of prey and on the few books that were on falconry as well, and pouring through the pictures and just absorbing everything. It was a magical time. And I remember being introduced to all these different species in, in paintings and in photos. And Merlin struck me as bland. They were small. And I remember distinctly the paintings in the old field guides I would see featuring the lightest phased Merlins. And they just, they seemed like, you know, the Maller stripe wasn't very distinct. And on the males, they had that beautiful powder baby blue as an adult on their wings. And it, it just, I, I saw, you know, peregrine falcon, prairie falcon, all these other birds just seemed so striking. And Merlins didn't catch my imagination. And because of that, uh, that unfounded bias, I didn't try flying them till years and years and years into my falconry career. It turns out they're one of the most amazing and incredible birds to fly. Merlins have something very special about them. Um, their size is more important than you might think. Now, Merlins are bird hunters. That's what they want to go after. And what what you would think, if you just think, oh, you know, there's kestrels, there's merlins, there's oplomato falcons, prairies, peregrines, jeers, and so on, you might just think it's just another size, but that's not the case. When birds are flying, there are so many factors that, 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 that cover everything. Um, the shape of their wings, of course, how much musculature they have, both as an individual and as a species, you know, the, the chest muscles. Are their feathers stiff and rigid? Are they flexible? Um, what is their weight? Because you have to remember, there's dynamic forces at work. You have the resistance of the atmosphere. And are you at a high elevation or a low elevation? The lower you are, the denser there is, so the more resistance there is, but also the more there is to push off of if you are flapping. So in other words, a bird diving from a higher elevation to begin with can dive faster than one at lower elevation. But on the other hand, you might have the opposite in level flight. And of course, the very pole of the earth itself. We don't think about these things. We're just like, there's a bird and it's going fast. Great. But you know what? It does matter. Here's where we start to see it. Start with a kestrel our smallest falcon here in North America. They're, they're strong little birds. They're fun to hunt with. They're fun to fly. They're small enough that the, um, the, the pole of Earth's gravitational force doesn't affect them that much. They're very buoyant, okay? But because they're so small, the density of atmosphere does cause more resistance. So a kestrel going in level flight just never gets that full, full, here comes the cavalry charge like other birds do. Even the most well-muscled kestrel, it, that resistance actually plays a factor. We don't think about it, but it does. They're like little butterflies. That's why when you usually see kestrels hunting, they're like, what's right below me that I can kill? There's a grasshopper. There's a mouse. And if they go after a bird in the wild, usually it's like an initial chase. And if they miss, eh, because they don't have that momentum. They don't have that musculature. Now, when you get to the bigger birds, like a peregrine falcon, a prairie falcon, then they are so big that they have enough mass and to build momentum to really punch through. But the caloric demands on their body to do so, to push through, uh, think about it when it comes to aerodynamics, which is easier to push through air at a certain speed. A semi-truck or a little car, little car, because it's, it's displacing less air. Well, no matter how streamlined a falcon is, a bigger falcon is having to do huge caloric demands in order to punch through, but it can. And that because of that extra weight to have momentum, then they're not nearly as buoyant. Merlins are the perfect wed of those two principles. They're big enough to have incredible momentum. 
that they could just there. Once they're to speed, nothing can stop them. However, they're light enough that they're not fighting the pull of Earth's gravity as much as the larger birds. So you're fairly buoyant for your size and have enough mass to really smash into prey and to get going. And you see the difference. Remember, Kestrel's watch below me, where Merlins are usually looking out, what's a half a mile to a mile away? Look, a mile away, there's some starlings. And they build full speed, and by the time they have that momentum, nothing can stop them. The starlings, which are very fast birds, fly up, and they just slice through, catch a bird. Uh, nothing stopping them. That's incredibly athletic to watch. And they can also, because of this, just shoot straight up. Both wild merlins and a trained merlin. I've seen wild merlins hunting horned larks. And they're just going up and over sagebrush. And all of a sudden, the, the horned lark goes straight up in the merlin. And they're go. it's like they both have jetpacks on. And they're just small enough by weight to be able to do that, that upward motion. It's just incredible. So a very fun bird to fly. Very fun bird to train. So I want to talk just briefly about how to trap them. Now, of course, if you want, you can go online. You can buy my book, Trapping Essentials, dun, dun, dun. And you can get more details. I try to have these videos not be too long and just give the basics, give somebody a taste for how some of these principles work. Merlins are highly migratory. We, you, 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 most people are aware of that. So they're, they're a northern bird. They live all over the northern part of the northern hemisphere. They like it cold. They're up in the taiga and up in the tundra, hunting all spring and summer. But then when you get into fall, their dinner migrates south. And so they do likewise. They're mostly hunting. Well, they're, they're bird hunters. It's what they're meant to do. And so they have to follow where their food goes. For those of us in areas where they occur, this is the ultimate bird to trap because they've got a few months under their belt of hunting so they're very seasoned hunters uh we're talking first year birds we don't keep adults so a first year merlin a passage bird we call it it's left its parents it's full sized but it's not an adult it doesn't have a mate it's migrating south it has plenty of hunting experience and tremendous musculature it's fit it's strong it's experienced it's easy to trap and it's usually easy to train. Most Merlins train very quickly. They learn the game and they're like, hey, this is, this works well for me. Let's, yeah, let's hunt together. So you are doing that. You're out looking for Merlins this time of year. It's perfect. Uh, usually we kind of start in October. October through December seems to be a really good time of year to trap Merlins locally here in Utah where I live. Before you go out, it's good to kind of have a, a little trick. Well, not a trick, but a little tip that I wish I had have had. Because you, you got to think, if this is an open area bird, oh, they're from the tundra, up on the taiga, out there, with the caribou roaming, and they're like, yes, I will, I will hunt a little bird up here. They're, they're kind of a wilderness bird. So when I was young and trying to learn how to trap and trying to learn how to find merlins, um, it's like, okay, I'm used to trapping red-tailed hawks which are out there, right? They're looking for mice and rats and voles in the farm fields and kestrels as well. Uh, but in those same farmlands and even more, uh, more desolate areas, you find the prairie falcons. And my thinking was, oh, you know, prairies are hunting a lot of horned larks, a lot of meadow larks, sparrows, starlings. These are things that I know Merlins hunt. So I assume I should be going where the prairie falcons are going. And for several years, I'd be driving, scouting, looking for Merlins, and I might see two Merlins a year. And I laugh at myself for making such an error, because nowadays, just on my way to work, I'll see four to six Merlins a day in the winter. Uh, they're in the cities. When they migrate south, all these, these songbirds, they're like, oh, it's desolate, oh, oh, look, cities, neighborhoods, suburbia. We plant trees and bushes. It's a great safe place to roost. We put out bird feeders. There's food for them to eat. And then to, uh, to another degree also, you got to think about all the junk we have out there in parking lots, behind grocery stores, outside of McDonald's. There's French fries everywhere. And you have things like that, like starlings eating those. So the Merlins come to the cities. You got to go in suburbia. Locally, what I do is I try to find, it doesn't matter how dense of forested the areas are, I go driving around looking for super tall phone poles or power poles in the hearts of the, it can even be a big city. I go in suburbia, but downtown big cities, you will still find Merlins in the winter. You can still find them rural. If you do, I more often find 
the Richardson's Merlin, which is the largest and the lightest subspecies. They're more often the ones I see out. But the two darker species, the Columbaris and the Suclei, usually find them uh, much more in the city. Before I show you this, uh, some of these clips of uh, going out trying to trap Merlins, there's two main traps that are typically used. The first is the Dogaza net, which is just the net suspended between two poles. It's got release clips in four corners of some kind and some sort of a drag line. So when the bird hits it, the net comes loose, wraps around them and brings them to a gentle stop. That's the Dogaza net. I have many friends who love to trap Merlins with phi traps. A phi trap is a ring, a hoop, with nooses around it and bait in the center. And the falcon dives down, gets his toes caught in it. I, it works well, but it's not what I use. I use a net. And here's my logic behind this idea. If you have a net and you have bait over here, falcon over here. If the falcon's coming down, even if it is, uh, it's hesitating a little, it doesn't fully commit and goes up, it's still going to get caught. And your bait is fine. If you have the phi trap, when that falcon comes in, if it's not fully committed, if it's nervous, it's going to go off and not be caught. So even a cautious, non-committing Merlin will typically still get caught in a Dogaza net system. So that is why I prefer it. Now in this video, I'm going to show a couple net systems. They're both Dogaza nets, but the first one we're going to take a look at is the one you've seen. If you've been watching my videos recently, I've showed uh, trapping kestrels and prairie falcons with the same net system. And it's a Dogaza made by Western Sporting Publications, and it has built into it bungee cords. And this prevents you from having to clip on a separate drag line. So the falcon gets caught, bungee cords pull apart, and it goes fine. So let's see how this first net works. We were out looking for Merlin's found one. Uh, it had been snowing really bad, so it's a good day. The birds are hungry. We put out for the Merlin, and almost instantly it comes down and gets caught in the net. This is an interesting point to think about, too. When you are setting up nets, sometimes it takes a minute, and the Merlin might take off in that time. So it's always good to... Uh, to pick when you're going to go. If you go in the early morning, they're, oh, where am I hunting? Where am I going? Oh, oh. And they, they're always on the move. And they might only be on a perch for a minute or two. And so by the time you get to a Merlin and start a setup, they may be gone. So I often go out in the late morning or early afternoon, as was this case. We had plenty of time in this case to not only set up the trap, but also the video camera and get it in focus so we could trap this. So when you do catch a Merlin, of course, you instantly go out, carefully pick up the bird, and you want to examine the bird itself, especially the feet. There could be foot injuries you should be aware of. Uh, anything from uh, wild animals chomp their foot when they caught it, all the way to uh, you can have, for example, we found one the other day that had missing talons, and we don't know why this was. It just happened to have some missing talons. And uh, we found, last year, we found a kestrel that had gotten caught in a glue trap and had got freed itself, but the glue had gooped all around one talon, so we, we got that off safely for it. So it's always good. Take a look at the bird. Take a look at its health. Look at the feathers, the wings, the keel. Is it fat? Has it eaten? How's the face look? How do the feet look? Make sure it's in good health. Now, you have to be sure as well, is this uh, a bird that you are looking for? Is this the gender you are after? Is it an age that you can legally have? Or is it an adult that you need to set free? All of these things. And of course, if it's a bird that is not one that you want or that maybe has some medical issues that uh, you don't want in a falconry bird, or, you know, then you set it free. If it's a, Or if it's not the gender you want, you set it free and keep on trapping. Let's take a look with another trap here. This is a Dogaza as well, but this is a more traditional setup where it's two poles, four clips, and a drag line that is clipped on separately underneath. Now, the one we're about to watch, this Merlin I've seen uh, for days, and so when we went out looking for Merlins, I knew a pole that it should be on. We set up our trap. The Merlin didn't notice it, and then noticed the Merlin the next pole down and went, chased that Merlin off and then turned around, looked at us, and we, oh, we altered the angle of the net, and it started coming down, and then saw us and was like, no, and went back to the original pole. We flipped the net around again, and then this happened. Merlin flies into the net, and of course, we ran out and made sure that the Merlin was okay, and that is 
basically just how simple this is. I love Dogaza net trapping. Um, a couple of thoughts. You're wise to do this with two people if you can. It's good to have one person manning the bait and, and the bait and the drag line and another person manning the net itself. And the nice thing about Merlins is if it's cold enough, they usually don't care. This second clip that I showed, I was actually hiding behind the truck. Everybody else is in the truck, but I had altered the net and ran. Oh, the Merlin started coming down and I was squatting down behind the truck. The Merlin saw me duck behind the truck and still went down and got caught anyways. So it's an interesting principle that Merlins can be very cosmopolitan. They can be very uh, accepting of human disturbance and human interference in their realm of hunting. You might not see that so much with something like a prairie falcon, but Merlins, you go to the cities, look for them, find them, and some of your setups you can do right by busy streets and it doesn't seem to bother them one bit. I hope that this gives you a little bit of information about Merlin trapping. Again, a species I cannot recommend highly enough. Please remember, all birds, of course, if you have your proper permits and you're getting into falconry, all birds require extreme attention to detail with weight management, but little birds, micro hawks we call them, like Merlins, Kestrels, Sharpshin Hawks, Cooper's Hawks, have particularly fast metabolisms. So if you choose to get a smaller species like a Merlin, be sure that you know what you're doing and that you are religiously devoted to your weight management every day. Because of that, I always keep my Merlins indoors and that's something I recommend to you as well. If you have a small bird like a Merlin or a Kestrel, keeping it indoors keeps the bird in a constant temperature when you're not hunting and that way it makes it far easier to regulate, calculate, and manage their weight management. Where if they're outside and suddenly the temperature drops, their weight can crash. You don't want that to happen. So couple of good tips. Hope you enjoyed seeing these video clips of trapping Merlins. Uh, if you haven't already, feel free to subscribe to my channel. Let me know what other videos you would like to see. And as always, happy hawking.